Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Katie Rowley. I am the Outreach Librarian for the NOAA Central Library, and we are very happy to host another of Ocean Exploration's uh, seminars. Uh, a few logistics before we begin. Uh, we are recording this seminar, so if you do need to step away or if you would like to share this with a colleague, we will have this posted on the library's YouTube channel after the fact. Um, also, since we are recording, anything you put into the question or chat panel will also be recorded and uh, we will be taking questions. The questions will be held until the end of the presentation and if we don't get to your question, since it is recorded, we will pass those questions on to our speaker to answer offline. Also, uh, if there's any technical issues today, such as you can't see the slides or you can't hear the speaker, please try logging off or logging back on. There's also an audio option for you to select which audio output or input you have. So please check those, because uh, it may be your settings or it may be the system. So you can try two options to solve that. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our host today, Liang Wu, to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, Katie. And welcome everyone to the NOAA Science Seminar Series, to the seminar called Exploration, Real-Time Multimodal AUV Mapping with Low Throughput Acoustic Links. This NOAA Science Seminar is co-hosted by NOAA Ocean Exploration, and NOAA Central Library. My name is Liang. I am a Canals Marine Policy Fellow working in the Science and Technology and Outreach and Education Divisions of NOAA Ocean Exploration. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our seminar speaker, Dr. Mike Jacuba, Senior Engineer from Hold, a Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, or HUI. Dr. Jacuba is an engineer with extensive experience designing and deploying marine robotic systems. He received his Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from MIT in 2000 and MS and PhD degrees in Mechanical Engineering slash Applied Ocean Physics and Engineering from the MIT Hui Joint Program in 2003 and 2007. He was a postdoctoral researcher at Johns Hopkins University and the Australian Center for Field Robotics in Sydney, Australia, prior to returning to Hui in 2011, where he now works as a senior engineer. Dr. Jacuba's project was supported through our Ocean Exploration Fiscal Year 2017 funding opportunity. Follow-on work is being supported by the NOAA Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. Thank you very much, Dr. Jacuba for your precious time to share with us your exciting work. The floor is yours. Great, well, thank you very much, Sam, for the introduction and for the opportunity uh, to present to you all on this project. So let me start by uh, trying to address the central question here, what is co-exploration? Uh, so our objective is to maximize the utility of throughput constrained links, in particular acoustic uh, communications links, and to some extent also maybe satellite links, although that's a little bit further on. So why? to enable more efficient multimodal survey, particularly in deep sea, and that includes both real-time operator-directed mission changes, as well as in future autonomy or advanced autonomy. So, and we see this as a methodology to speed autonomy development and the deployment of autonomy, uh, so that ultimately, again, we can uh, have more autonomy-directed mission changes with operators acting more in an oversight manner, and ultimately, perhaps not at all. Um, the kind of uh, grounding idea behind this is that humans and robots can act as a team because they each bring strengths to the problem of exploration in the deep sea. Uh, top side, we have extensive scientific expertise, the logistical and operational expertise of the vehicles, uh, vehicle team, as well as the context of, of a research cruise. What else is going on as weather coming up and so forth. On the other hand, we don't have access to the data in real time, typically, uh, whereas the vehicle does, has access to all the data that it's collected up till that point anyway. So I'll return to this figure on the right in a moment, but for me, it's provided really the uh, inspiration for uh, how we structured this work and, um, and is a classical example of nested survey in the deep sea to find hydrothermal venting on the seafloor. Before we dive into that, uh, I wanna talk briefly about the acoustic channel. So <clears throat> acoustic modems are now really ubiquitous in the AUV world. And that's thanks to significant technological progress, especially in the last 30 years but also because the acoustic channel really is the best option for communication at the ranges most relevant to AUV work, especially deep sea AUV work. 
broadly, there are three classes of communication modalities available underwater that do not require tethers, so independent of that. And the plot here, with courtesy of Sonodyne, depicts bandwidth or throughput uh, versus range. All of these modalities suffer a trade-off between throughput and range. So starting with the blue or free space optical modems, uh, these offer speeds that are sufficient for transmitting video, um, but are limited to ranges of around 100 meters. So for AV applications, this makes a optical modem suited to data exfiltration, but not for real-time access to survey data from a moving vehicle that's going to be typically kilometers away. Uh, electromagnetic or radio methods are either very short range or require large antennas and high power, so typically not suited um, to AV work. Acoustic modems then, that leaves acoustics, and really these are the best and probably the only option for ranges in excess of one kilometer, again, on that scale that typically AV surveys happen. But so let's consider what these numbers mean in intuitive terms. Uh, whereas video is possible with the, with the free space optical link, um, a, an acoustic link operating at that sort of one to 10 kilometer sweet spot for surveying offers something more like a text message, perhaps with an attached image, but nevertheless something that arrives on the order of every few minutes or perhaps sub minute, but uh, much, much less data. And that figure is not an optimum by any means, but that reflects the reality of an imperfect and lossy channel in real operations. Um, satellite kind of fits, in, fits into this too. Of course, it's not available underwater, but for autonomous platforms, arguably, uh, there are limits in terms of throughput imposed by cost and power rather than by the physics of the process. All right, so now I want to go into hydrothermal, the hydrothermal use case a little bit, or nested survey in the context of hydrothermal um, uh, pr prospecting in a little more detail, again, because I think it provides important background for the way that I think about this problem. So we'll start with the anatomy of a hydrothermal plume. This is a video from a, in a, an aquarium in which a stratified uh, water column was, was set up. And, and I thank Chris German for, for this video. So in a hydrothermal system, water is pulled into the seafloor. It's heated and ejected in these concentrated jets, forming what is uh, labeled here as a buoyant plume. As the plume rises, it entrains the surrounding water and eventually reaches the, the same density as the surrounding seawater at the height of the so-called non-buoyant plume. And then that spreads out laterally over scales of, of tens to hundreds of kilometers, depending on what sensing modality you're talking about. So for the purposes of finding a relatively tiny vent on the seafloor, these uh, features in the water column provide a very convenient means um, of doing so. So, uh, <clears throat> and that idea was leveraged uh, in the mid 2000s with pioneering work by Chris German uh, and the Abe AUV to use an AUV to localize vents on the seafloor. So here's that figure again. The basic strategy was this sort of three-stage survey that started up in a neutrally buoyant plume, which was at a physically large signature. So if you were in there, you knew that at some point uh, buoyant plumes would intersect it, and your goal was essentially to find those, those buoyant plume stems. And here's data from that uppermost water column survey. This is temperature, optical backscatter, and vertical velocity. In some cases, the plumes would actually push the vehicle up. Uh, and so it would take, at this point, an expert to identify what was going on here in terms of neutrally buoyant plume versus a buoyant plume. Um, and we would pull the vehicle up, look at this data, and decide where to send it next. So the second survey in the sequence was at 50 meters altitude. It would collect bathymetry for both context, as, and the, the line spacing was sufficiently dense to assure hitting any buoyant plumes in the area so that, again, we had confirmation of what was it, what represented, say, active vent sites on the seafloor versus um, lumps and bumps that perhaps were or were not meaningful in terms of hydrothermalism. The final survey was then at five meters, collecting uh, biological context, uh, floral mosaic of the seafloor, again, with sufficient density to, uh, to hit those chemical anomalies. So chemical anomalies in the water column were critical to the whole idea. So the vehicle was instrumented uh, very thoroughly for that process. So there were obstacle backscatter probes, two conductivity and temperature, uh, two, two CTDs in order to be able to measure not only temperature anomalies, but also gradients in the water column. And the really critical instrument turned out to be a redox potential probe, um, which essentially captures um, fresh hydrothermal water or any chemically uh, unfinished water, let's say, uh, in the water column. So it's not a very quantitative instrument the way we used it, but exceptionally good for detecting the presence of relatively fresh hydrothermal water. And then on the bottom of the vehicle, you can see the sort of usual array of instruments for mapping the seafloor, both photographically and multi-beam. Um, so looking again at those surveys in a little bit more detail, um, these are plots of chemical anomalies as measured by, by the Abe vehicle back in 2004 in the Lao Basin. Uh, the plot on the left shows the uh, sort of phase one or stage one survey. This is in a neutrally buoyant plume. Um, 
you can see in the dashed box where we deployed the vehicle for phase two or the for the bathymetric survey on the right and then where phase three was deployed for the photo survey so obviously we're picking up on these uh, localized signals associated unambiguously with buoyant plumes uh, eh or redox potential hits as well as in this case a vertical excursion of the vehicle so the vehicle was actually pushed up by the plume um, but uh, you know a key takeaway from this is that the amount of time the vehicle spent surveying relative to the amount of time that it spent actually detecting anything was very large so the first uh, the the hits that boy and plume was actually on the first three track lines of this survey and the end of the survey wasn't even within the non boy and plume and likewise in the phase two survey we had a large portion of the survey that didn't encounter any venting although uh, one sort of important complexity here is that there's not typically just one vent there's the often event uh, field so that's what we saw here several several vents um, but this naturally led to the idea well how can we automate this right so can we have the vehicle um, figure out where these things are on its own so that we don't have to recover it between each of these dives and decide what to do. Um, so in this case, we could leverage the relative simplicity of interpreting the chemical data into an algorithm that allowed Abe to selectively target the latter portions of its mission. So this is a step back from trying to automate that whole process, but uh, but progress in that direction. So here's a photo survey from a survey uh, uh, from a dive in the Southern Mid-Atlantic at the Southern Mid-Atlantic Ridge in 2005 where the chemical data were clustered, particular redox temperature. So this is a low altitude survey, five meters. So the data, the anomalies here are very strong. Um, and the data was clustered autonomously on board the vehicle. Uh, and then those clusters were ranked in terms of the strength of the anomalies encountered. And then the vehicle was uh, allowed to place additional survey lines that were sort of pre-planned in terms of what they looked like, but not the location of them. So it was, it was allowed to place those surveys on top of the, the uh, clusters that it found most exciting. In this case, the clusters were all pretty close to each other, the, the top three ranked ones. And so the vehicle put all the track lines and those subsequent uh, lines on that spot. Um, so, and you know, so that I think this speaks to a number of points. So first of all, this approach was necessarily conservative, right? The delivery of a nominal survey product was guaranteed. We were, no matter what happened with the autonomy, bugs or otherwise, the vehicle was gonna deliver this photo survey that the um, scientists want it. And these are expeditions that cost a lot of money and take a lot of time. It's, uh, it's a, it's a risk averse environment. So difficult to, to prototype autonomy. in. Um, <clears throat> we could also rely here on very strong chemical anomalies because we were low in the water column. So there was little ambiguity in terms of detections. Um, so put another way, our autonomy did not have to be very sophisticated to do the job. Um, in the end, it wasn't all that efficient either in the sense that it still required doing a sort of full survey. It was essentially doing the process that we did on the ship with all the previous surveys, but in situ. Um, so better than recovering the vehicle to collect more data over the spot, but not as good as, as uh, deciding to, to uh, resurvey exciting locations as they're encountered. Uh, but again, these were hedges against not having the sort of context or expertise uh, on board the vehicle or at least a very simple version of it. Uh, and actually, in some ways, it worked a little too well. So this is actually a, a, a burn mark from Abe on Abe that we found upon recovering the vehicle. So at least at some point, it got very close to a hydrothermal vent. All right, so I talked about the hydrothermal uh, use case, but nested survey is much more general and applies uh, in a lot of use cases uh, in the deep sea. And this is just a, a selection, but so on the left is multimodal nested uh, survey from both the ship and AUV Sentry. Um, looking for methane seeps, extensive uh, seeps along the eastern seaboard. Um, in the middle, multimodal AV surveys in the context of the Deepwater Horizon disaster, searching for coral hard grounds using bathymetry and side scan, followed up by photo surveys. And on the right, uh, multimodal nested survey looking for the uh, Air, Fla Air France Flight 447 on a crash site using multi resolution side scan, followed up by images for, for confirmation of the aircraft's location. So how does COEX fit into this? What does COEX look like? Um, so the COEX toolbox as it currently exists, exists uh, consists of three utilities for three core types of data, multi-resolution bathymetry, time series data, and imagery. Um, I should point out that operational messages, which all vehicles use these days uh, for sort of communicating things like faults, battery status, location, and so forth, are prioritized and explicitly part of the architecture. So uh, those messages are always passed. The goal of co-exploration is to use the rest of the available bandwidth to send data that's of interest to operators and scientists in the context of the scientific mission, rather than just operating the vehicle. Um, <clears throat> we built this 
architecture uh, using ROS, the robot operating system for inter-message or inter-process communication. Uh, that's key to making it portable to other platforms. And it also allowed us to use something called ROS ACOMS, which I won't go into too much detail about, uh, but was a, a project developed here or in development here at Wood Solution Graphic um, that essentially provides a transparent pass-through for ROS messages uh, between Topside and SubC in a way that respects the uh, limitations of the acoustic channel. So um, for each data type, we've got sort of four core elements. Sub-C, there's a driver for each instrument. So in case of a multi-beam driver, various drivers for all the different sources of time series data, CTD, for example, fluorometry, fluorometry et cetera, uh, and a driver for the camera. These produce data that are aggregated by these sender modules that perform various processing, in particular encoding of this data in a progressive way so that it can be efficiently sent topside. Those elements communicate with ROS ACOMS, uh, which provides this transparent channel to topside, where again, that data is aggregated into some uh, consistent uh, version of the data that, that incorporates all of what has come up so far. And that communicates finally with a GUI that provides a visual representation of that aggregated data, as well as a means for operators to decide what portion of the data they would like more of, higher resolution typically, um, or of different chunk. So very briefly, ROS ACOMS, again, is this means of, uh, of, uh, of providing a transparent pass-through for ROS messages between topside and sub-C, respecting the characteristics of the limited throughput link provided by acoustics. So in particular, ROS messages are encoded in a very efficient way, um, user specifiable to agree to, to a large degree, um, and topics or the individual message types uh, or individual message types are sent on topics. And each of those topics can be uh, reprioritized um, to decide what goes first. So top priority in our case is always operational data. Um, it's also modular in that the hardware interface node, what's labeled here as the ACOMS driver node, uh, is provided with ROS ACOMS and specific to the micromodem, HUI micromodem, but this is fairly easy to swap out for other modems and I'll, and I'll describe an example of that in uh, towards the end of the talk. All right, so a key part of, uh, of COEX and as it applies to using ROS ACOMS is that ROS ACOMS was originally designed to support a network of fully autonomous AUVs rather than human in the loop communication. So that required some changes and I think there's actually quite a bit of work left to do here. But we've made some good progress. So the system is originally was configured at startup with fixed queue sizes and fixed priorities for each of those topics and a fixed uh, media access control, or like almost always a TDMA, time division multiplex access um, to the to the acoustic channel, basically to allow to to set up time slots where everybody in the system was allowed to talk or had to be quiet. Um, so as part of COEX, we added some hooks to, to ROS ACOMS that allow the operator to to enable and disable cues and adjust their priority in real time rather than always ahead of the fact. So this is particularly important in a nested survey context where initially you might be interested in chemical data, then later on with bathymetric data, perhaps following up on a target with imagery yields nothing. So you go back to doing bathymetric survey. So you, what, what is of interest is always changing. Um, <clears throat> this is what that GUI looks like. Basically it allows you to select uh, different topics, reprioritize them, turn them on and off. There's a long way to go here. Uh, in particular, there's nothing, I think it's gonna be pretty critical to understand like, well, what the trade-offs are. How long will it take me to get this image up or, or that chunk of bathymetry? So understanding that is going to be a big part of, of moving this from uh, an engineer running it to a scientist running it. All right, so I'll jump now into the actual tools themselves. So there are, again, three core tools, time series, multi-beam, and photo imagery. Um, we'll start with the time series data. So here's what the time series GUI looks like. Again, this is kind of the topmost layer of the whole thing. Um, and you're seeing uh, data that was telemetered up during a mission that shows salinity, temperature, um, and depth. There's also the possibility in this case, this is all configured at startup, to telemeter up turbidity or chlorophyll, um, and also some engineering data that's not typical like battery current, uh, but those haven't been requested yet by, by the user. So it's a pretty simple approach. The basic idea here is that this data is of sufficiently low <clears throat> volume that we can keep all of it in memory and subsea and the user can request portions of it as needed, depending on whatever it is they're trying to understand. Perhaps even just an engineering problem, what's going on with the vehicle, I need thruster data, for example. Um, so there's no interpolation or, or compression applied here. Of course, you probably don't wanna use your limited acoustic channel for telemetering up full rate data. So it's gonna be, uh, as opposed to say bathymetry 
bathymetry data. So uh, it could, this can be much more useful if you have something sub C that's alerting you to when the data is of interest, and then you can use this to to find out uh, to to follow up on that. So here's an example of again kind of in the hydrothermal plume context of uh, a sub C of sub C processing of EH or ORP data that attempts to identify um, data uh, likely indicative of contact with a with a buoyant plume. So this is applying on the upper plot you see uh, the raw EH or ORP data. On the lower plot is the the rate or differentiated version, or essentially the upper plot. The data highlighted in orange has been identified autonomously as an outlier, uses a robust statistic to determine what in what uh, sort of what interval it represents mean data versus outlier. And then the black um, highlighted circles are are peaks that the algorithm has selected as both significant and sufficiently separated from one another that they are probably related to different phenomena um, in the water column. All right, so, so this could be running sub C and it summarizes the data in a very concise way. Just essentially these black dots tell you everything you need to know. And these evolve over time. As you get more data, the, uh, <clears throat> you'll get uh, different sort of best hits. Um, but, all right, so, but, if that's all you're telemetering up, and you can do this because it's such a tiny amount of data, you can do it along in parallel with everything else. Uh, it doesn't look like much. So this is just to compare the small section of the data now, but this is what, what's going on sub C. Again, you have the raw EH, the rate, what's been identified as anomalous in green, and then peaks in red, and then the black ones as, uh, as selected for transmission because they're both intense and sufficiently spatially separated. Um, <clears throat> so when you look at that top side, there's not a whole lot here, but there's indicative, but that's indicative of something interesting from the robots perspective. So now you can follow up on this using the COEX time series tool by asking for more data in that region. So the, the two things you can specify are the region you're interested in and what rate you want the data. So in this case, the gray box is the region that the operator was interested in and they asked for data at half a Hertz. Um, and shortly thereafter, the algorithm sends up the data. So what you can see here in in, uh, in the black trace. And if you know what you're looking at, these are reasonably interesting uh, EH uh, anomalies. The fact that they follow one right after another is also exciting because that suggests there's a lot going on in that region. Um, it's probably not enough to decide this is a anomaly worth following up on. So you might query more of the data to see what the background looks like, make sure the instrument's not just misbehaving or look at corroborating data from the other chemical instruments. So multi-beam bathymetry is a little bit more sophisticated, but still a pretty simple approach. Um, so uh, basically, the idea is to create a map sub C, but encode it in a way that allows uh, it to be transmitted topside in a progressive fashion from low resolution to high resolution. So the data structure we use for that is called a quad tree. Um, it's depicted here in 1D rather than 2D. It basically consists of a uh, uh, essentially a bunch of cells that that shrink in size as you or that subdivide as you go down the tree uh, in, into finally into the leaves, where each cell has contains the average of the average bathymetry in that spatial region. <clears throat> and so you get a uh, sort of one number at the root, which which it represents the average of all of the bathymetric data down to uh, down to individual cells, in our case, a maximum or best resolution of one meter, um, uh, where the average is over all the data that fall in that one meter one meter blocks um those one meter blocks so this is a very natural data structure to store two and a half d graded data because it allows the map to expand uh, as more data is collected and it allows for arbitrarily high resolution in depth all right so here's what it looks like this is a short section of a bathymetric survey correct, collected by the new vehicle in june so you can see the track line of the vehicle here uh, this is 16 meter resolution data and all the way down to two meter resolution data in this case. Um, you see some, some holes in the data here. So each of these gray boxes represents uh, a chunk of data that can be transmitted up in one go at the given resolution. So you have a fairly large chunk of 16 meter resolution data, a fairly small chunk of two meter resolution data. Um, and the algorithm does not try to, uh, um, to make a perfect map. It doesn't try to make a map without holes. So it's not it's not asking for acknowledgement that the data has been received. Rather, it relies on a human to decide whether the data that's been sent or that wasn't received is of enough value to actually ask for it. 
So these holes are dropped packets. And again, a very much a reality of working with ACOMs um, in the deep sea. You can combine this all together into a multi-resolution version of the bathymetry. So you're seeing the same data as you saw in the previous plot, just instead of as individual layers, as a combined uh, map where higher resolution is used where it's available and lower resolution where it isn't. So you can see the 16 meter bathymetry, 16 meter bathymetry on the uh, outside of the, of the survey and higher resolution on the inside. So the GUI that goes along with the uh, multi-beam process looks like this. Um, and it does a few important things. One, it aggregates all the data that's been collected so far, produces that multi-resolution map. And the second thing is that it allows users to select portions of the data that they are interested in. And in this case, depicted by the gray box, query the subsea system for data in there at a resolution that they can specify. All right, so finally, we have the, uh, the camera image workflow. Um, so it starts with images being collected by the camera being saved to disk and annotated in some way or the file names uh, being written in such a way that they are identifiable by, identifiable by either sequence number or timestamp. Um, the scientists, in order to queue an image for transmission, the top site operator specifies a timestamp or sequence number, which is then transmitted acoustically. And the subsea process then here labeled as the image processor does some pre-processing to the, to the corresponding image and then places it into another directory for transmission. Then we use this library called Progressive Imagery that was written by Toby Schneider, which encodes those images in uh, using a uh, progressive encoding, the JPEG 2000 encoding in this case, uh, which has a key property in that every time one of these, um, you receive a full image every time something is transmitted topside, uh, but it starts off with very blurry and becomes progressively finer detail with no data being retransmitted in the process. So essentially you're getting the higher frequency component of, of the image or the next higher frequency component of the image with each with each uplink. Let's take a look what that looks like. So here are images from again from the new vehicle. These are pretty coarse images, 640 by 480. So this is a from a these are actually frame grabs from a from a standard def definition camera. But again in the context of what we're trying to do here, look for things on the seafloor, um, make sure the coverage is where we want it to be. We don't really need super high resolution um, and probably better off using lower resolution and getting more images up than, than a higher resolution image. So with one frame, if you're, if you're in this case, most of the background was sand. So actually this already indicates that there's something interesting going on. And by 16 frames, you have a pretty good sense that there's a wreck on the sea floor. And for context, that's about 40 seconds at 10 kilohertz, which is kind of the right frequency for again, sort of one to 10 kilometers um, with a two kilohertz bandwidth. To get much more than that takes a lot more data and a lot more time. Um, but probably again in this context is not necessary. All right, so what is so here is the uh, the image uplink GUI. It provides a few key functions. It shows you the progress on each image. It shows you uh, which images you requested. It allows you to start and stop uplink and to request that any given image be uh, uploaded to a certain or uplink to a certain uh, resolution. And <clears throat> excuse me, it allows you to request. And allows you to stop transmission and request new images. So I should point out or emphasize that uh, that COEX, the way it's configured, is always sending data. So whether someone has specified priorities or not, um, the, we're never using, we're never leaving the acoustic channel unutilized. So it has default uh, plans for what to send unless it's been told otherwise. So I'll go now into. Uh, some results from a recent cruise. This is from the uh, OACI tech demo cruise in June of this year. Um, we uh, ran COEX on the Nui vehicle, which you can see here suspended from the crane uh, with the key COEX related hardware called out. So there's the acoustic modem transducers in this upper fin. We actually had three different channels, three and a half kilohertz, 10 kilohertz, and a sonar nine modem on there. So actually that TDMA I spoke about uh, was quite important because we were changing, we were devoting different portions of the of every minute to each or every two minutes uh, to each uh, modality or each different frequency. Um, on the other side of the vehicle, there was a multi-beam sonar and again, a downward looking camera, lots of chemical sensors too inside the vehicle, although in this case, there wasn't a whole lot going in, on in the water column. So I don't have any results from that uh, portion of the of the system, but we'll talk about the the other two survey modalities, other two sort of classic servo, survey modalities in a second. Um, we were on board the Nautilus, along with two other vehicles, the Mesobot and the Drix, so it was a pretty 
crowded deck, but a lot of fun. Um, and it allowed us an opportunity to show how these vehicles can work together. So before describing that though, I wanna point out that NUI is a somewhat special vehicle. It's a hybrid AUV ROV, um, has the ability to do intervention work on the seafloor as well as act like an AV, which is the mode that we used it in, in, in this case. Uh, but it is connected to, when tethered, it's connected to its host vessel via hair thin, unarmored optical fiber. And that's this, what we call here, the micro tether that goes between a depressor, the tow body, which is then pulled by the vehicle. And that's, I think, a really valuable characteristic for development of tools like this that have to do with autonomy, because it allows the vehicle to move independently of the vessel as if it were an AUV, while providing a effectively unlimited bandwidth link to the vehicle, uh, between the vehicle and operators. So you can supervise, tweak, um, and recompile even uh, autonomy modules running on the vehicle, um, again, without needing to, without having a tether that constrains the motion of the vehicle. All right, so the first story I wanna talk about is, is use of the DRIX as a relay. Uh, so the DRIX ASV, uh, in this case, had a high, high bandwidth radio link between the vessel and itself. So that's not really particularly relevant to the COEX uh, paradigm in that send whatever you want across that. Um, but the link between the DRIX, between the DRIX and the NUI was via a Sonar 9 USB-L and modem. Uh, so in this case, not the micro modem, but we were able to adapt the whole, adapt Ross ACOMs and COEX to the use of the Sonar 9 modem pretty easily by replacing that module that is normally driving a micro modem with uh, a module driving a Sonar 9, again, on either side of the system. Uh, so this was exciting because we had this relay that you can, in this case, was used over a you know, fairly modest range of a few kilometers, but still it allowed the ship to do other things while we were doing while we were doing a mapping task. And it's extensible, I think, to much longer ranges with systems operating you know, offshore by uh, by themselves potentially for weeks or months at a time, where this this idea of relaying data from the subsea to the surface um, is going to be also over relatively low throughput satellite links probably. And uh, I think these tools have a, a potential for a lot of value there too. So here's the multi-beam map uh, that we produced during this particular dive. It's pretty ugly. Um, the, the, we were surveying a rather steep feature on the seafloor and portions of it were had slopes of over 45 degrees. And, um, and so that compromised Nui's navigation to a degree. And this is a really important lesson. So uh, Nui relies in large part on dead reckoning uh, that itself relies on uh, velocity data from a Doppler velocity log. And if you're too close to the seafloor um, or over very rough terrain, the data coming out of that instrument is not very useful for navigation. And so the navigation from a vehicle was, uh, was suffered as a result. Um, and thinking about how this data stored sub C, right? It's in a quad tree where the data, where the raw data is essentially lost. Once it's pulled into one of those cells, it becomes part of an average and there's no changing it. So if that cell no longer, because the navigation has been corrupted, is no longer where the vehicle thought it was, well, it has, there's no way to deal with that um, in that context. So I think we've got some work there to provide a somewhat more robust means of handling uh, this kind of thing, which, you know, it, it frankly, it does, it does happen. Um, and it's often isolated to like a single, inst single moment of, of time during the survey where DBL's bottom lock is lost for a little while but we need a way to handle that in, in practice going forward, um, even if it's not usually this severe. Again, the exciting part about this was that this data was telemetered up in real time across this multi-vehicle link. All right, so the second story I wanna share is really, for me, a culmination of the whole COEX idea. Um, and in and actually ended up, I think, working out better than, than we originally in, intended. So the, um, this is a, a, a demonstration of the whole multimodal nested survey idea, uh, and it was a, essentially conceived of as a contrived uh, example to, to demonstrate how the whole system would work together. Um, the idea was that we would perform a nested archaeological survey where we would fly over some wrecks, uh, mapping with multi-beam, identify those wrecks in the multi-beam, and then fly the vehicle over those wrecks, um, to collect verifying uh, camera images without recovering the vehicle between. So we had a site where we knew there were wrecks and we had ground truth locations for those wrecks. So an ideal sort of, again, contrived setup where we knew what uh, the right answer was ahead of time. So the vehicle's uh, multi-beam survey 
It's just a fraction of it. You can see here is shown in these lines. Then the MOPV map that was generated is shown underneath. You can see two targets in the, in the data identified as A and B, but this map wasn't immediately available at the conclusion of the multi-beam survey. We were about three water depths away from the, from the vessel and the acoustic performance was really quite poor. So we weren't getting the data back up at the rate we had hoped we had hoped for. So we decided we'll do a ROV search for these locations to verify that we in fact have the ground truth locations correct. And we were on the tether, so this was possible to do. So this is the, the track the ROV took. These are locations in red, red crosses where we expected the wrecks to, uh, to lie on the basis of the data that we had ahead of time. And we couldn't find A at all because it turns out we were in the wrong place. Uh, B also wasn't where, wasn't where it was expected, although we did manage to find it using primarily the imaging sonar, uh, the forward-looking imaging sonar on the vehicle. Uh, in the end, we still didn't have enough of a map up to, to see uh, the multi-beam at the resolution we needed. So the vehicle drove back to underneath the vessel essentially as a data mule and uplinked the, the bathymetric data uh, acoustically in what was then a vertical channel and much higher, much higher throughput. Um, so while that was an inefficiency, it was far more efficient than having to recover the vehicle, look at the data, and put it back as you would do in a conventional, in a conventional setup. So once we finally had this map, we could see pretty clearly two bumps on the seafloor, and it was also immediately obvious that they were not where expected, but actually lined up pretty well with where the ROV survey was. So we designed a camera survey to fly over the bumps. And again, this is, this is all data that was telemetered topside acoustically, and the planning was all based on those maps, not on anything to do with what was coming up over the tether. So these are the vehicle tracks on the camera survey. As it flew over the site, uh, we, we started requesting images uh, up from the seafloor. So the first image we got was 1718. That corresponds with the closest pass the first time we crossed over the site. And although there's mostly nothing in this image, you can see a little bit in the lower left-hand corner. Um, to confirm that as a potential target, we asked for 1714 through 1717. And you can see now, not perfect, but um, pretty clear indication of a wreck on the seafloor. The vehicle passed over that site again, and then we got the, the sort of full confirmation that we were in the right place um, with image 1784 here. So, Again, for me, this is a, I think, a really nice demonstration of how it all worked together, and we actually, and then we ended up using the, the whole system rather in anger rather than uh, in a fully contrived way. So I haven't talked yet so much about how autonomy fits into this and development of autonomy. So there's, I'll admit, far, we've done far less work in this in this domain, but I think there's lots of potential. So, uh, so let's consider the sort of classic sense plan act loop uh, is that that corresponds to running autonomy on, on robots. Sensing and acting are the purview of the robot. That has to happen in some C. But the planning phase of this can be a hybrid that uh, allows sort of any amount of human interaction from a fully manual development of a plan through to a fully autonomous development of a plan and, and everything in between. For example, um, humans may provide just high level additional constraints or objectives uh, and, and weightings of various objectives as they change because weather is coming up, for, for example. Um, the role that COEX tools play in this is in providing the sense data topside so that these plans can be generated. And again, there are various uh, levels of this from, from fully uh, raw data up through to data that's been processed very heavily subsea and where the robot has made decisions about what is likely to be of most interest. We have a couple examples of this. So this is a early example um, of, of autonomy development using the predates the use of the term coex, but that uses kind of the same philosophy. So this was a, during a hydrothermal prospecting ex expedition in the Cayman Trough. We were using the Nereus vehicle configured as an AUV. And we had the vehicle telemeter up minimally processed uh, redox potential data that were fed into an algorithm that tried to assess the value of revisiting a previous location versus continuing the survey. So essentially, it was trying to balance the value of new data versus going back to some place where potentially interesting data was collected, but without knowing of how good the data could be moving forward. So the plot here is showing the revisitation value of this discretized set of locations the vehicle could fly back to. This spot here was identified on the first portion of the survey, which was pre-planned, the western side. Um, 
And on the basis of that and what the algorithm was saying, we planned this, uh, the western side, which was downlinked to the vehicle. And indeed, it found a uh, more exciting spot close to where um, it's initially, uh, where it initially identified a, a high value target. The, the new target is a now higher visitation value relative to that original target. I'm at the end of the survey. So we ran, <clears throat> we ran this algorithm topside. So it was not running on the vehicle and it generated potential mission continuation plans and we generated potential mission uh, continuation plans for it to consider. So in that way, we constrained the choices available to the algorithm. It wasn't given complete control over where the vehicle could go. And that was necessary to respect other priorities on the vessel that were not easily captured or are often dynamic. So in a very practical way, we also had complete oversight over, over the algorithm. So this was, you know, in some sense being developed in, in real time. But of course, uh, more sophisticated subsea data processing will yield more capable autonomy. So as part of this project, uh, co-PI Yogi Girdhar, again here at Hui, applied some of his machine learning approaches to the autonomous classification of subsea imagery collected by Sentry. This is after the fact, not in real time. Um, so the Sunshine, I'll run this for you. The Sunshine terrain uh, characterization algorithm can autonomously group images <clears throat> into habitat classes by considering both image content as well as the spatial relationship between images. So what you're seeing here on the bottom is the fraction of each image as a function uh, of image number. So the number of images is growing. So that's why the plot's growing. Um, <clears throat> uh, the fraction of each image that the algorithm has decided represents a particular class of habitat. On the upper right is the habitat map. So this is the sort of aggregated version of everything it's seeing. It's best estimate of how these habitats are laid out spatially on the seafloor. And this all evolves with time. The, the data, all the data is considered all the time. And you'll see that as the algorithm continues, the habitats become more spatially continuous um, and better defined. So crucially, this algorithm does not require a priori knowledge of habitat characteristics. For example, no need for example images or feature sets, nor does it require a priori knowledge about the number of habitats. So this unsupervised approach is particularly suited to exploration as a result, but absent abstract metrics like rareness, for example, uh, to adapt the vehicle's trajectory in real time, humans need to determine which habitats are of interest and either directly manipulate vehicle trajectories to hit uh, portions of the map that are of interest um, or else rely on subsea autonomy to execute higher level directives like, for example, avoid sand because it's not of interest. All right, so <clears throat> future work. Um, there's lots of work to be done here. Uh, user interfaces, there are more survey modalities that I think are, are well suited to this approach, size scan sonar, sub bottom profiling in particular. We've got a lot of work to do uh, on link management, handling multiple links, including satellite. Uh, we are working with the NDSF to, um, to add elements of coax to, to vehicle operations, so particularly image transfer on Alvin, um, some of these tools for multimodal nested survey on Sentry. Uh, one one challenge here is a sort of push pull between wanting this this software to be broadly transferable and needing to integrate it with existing vehicle topsides. Uh, so you can't, for example, interpret much of this data without seeing also where the vehicle's navigation is. So in some sense, pulling coax data and coax visualizations into existing topside uh, visualization and situational awareness tools is of high value, but it also makes the the um, the work here less general. So that really only applies to the GUI level, but nevertheless, this is something we're, uh, we're trying with, with Sentry essentially to, to integrate things a bit more uh, uh, thoroughly with their top side. Um, we just got some recent funding from NOAA OECI to continue the work, which I'm excited about. That includes both autonomy development, which will be done by Yogi Girdhar and Leo Masloni at the University of Southern Mississippi. This is focused on the autonomous identification of coral hard grounds. So, Kind of repeating some of that work you saw earlier with Sentry, only in a more autonomous way. At the same time, and in parallel, we're developing something we're calling the modular autonomy payload. The idea is to take uh, some of this software, as well as the software that Yogi and others are developing, and integrate them with hardware that itself can be moved between different vehicles. So again, to try and make this stuff more portable. Um, and key to that is uh, tight integration with cameras, which are uh, a high, high power compute that's readily that's readily uh, replaced as, as the technology evolves so that we're not relying on usually very tightly integrated um, uh, 
uh, computational resources inside the vehicle, built-in timing and synchronization, um, and also uh, in a, an acoustic modem. It is an unfortunate rea reality that more and more acoustic modems uh, keep getting added to the market and none of them talk to each other. So uh, I don't think there's a general solution to this, but our uh, practical solution is to ship this system with an acoustic modem, both topside and subseat, it's integrated so that that whole headache, frankly, doesn't have to be repeated every time uh, you, you want to use some of this stuff on a new vehicle. Um, one thing that's very much missing from this is the sonar, and unfortunately there's not a whole, whole or a good way about that. It's just impractical to supply enough power um, nor uh, from a, a client bottle like this to sonar and usually they're big enough that it doesn't and expensive enough that really they come with the vehicle and they're tightly integrated there so we're going to rely on a, an ethernet link to the sonar to apply some of the multi-beam bathymetry and, and side scan work that i've been talking about all right uh, so dissemination of the wire community so there is a paper that laura Lindsay, one of the co-authors here put together she's also responsible for a lot of these slides so i'm very indebted to her um, that's was presented at IEEE EUV uh, just two months ago, or last month. Um, that's not yet available on IEEE Explore, but I'm happy to send you a copy if you like. There's my email. Um, the code has all been all, all been open sourced, again, largely thanks to Laura's efforts. So progressive imagery, all the COEX tools for bathymetry and, side and, uh, and time series, as well as a quick start that has uh, example data from the NUI, have all been open sourced and are available on those links there. Ross ACOMS, which again is an independent project, uh, is also available open source and very valuable in its own right, um, whether you find uh, COEX useful or not. So I encourage you to check those things out and in particular try the quick start. Uh, I have a ton of people to acknowledge as you know you saw from the hydrothermal work, this thinking behind this goes back a long way. Um, but let me start with uh, my co-authors, especially Laura, Isaac Vandor, Toby Schneider, Eric Gallimore from the ACOMS group, and Carl Kaiser, who was responsible for, uh, who was a lead PI in this grant when it was first um, uh, awarded, uh, but has, has since left TUI, so I was fortunate enough to, to take over from him um, and with a really good foundation already in place. Primary sponsorship was from the Office of uh, Ocean Exploration and more, more recent funding from the OECI. I want to acknowledge the, the NUI team who, uh, you know, the very important task of actually getting the vehicle in and out of the water so we could do this work. Captain and crew of the RV Nautilus and expedition leader Jason Fahey, the Drix team, uh, several of whom you see here, uh, who, who were of course integral to, to the relay demonstration that we pulled off. Um, I didn't talk much about the data, but we had a second cruise where there were some coex elements trialed aboard the RV Thompson with the Century team, and especially want to acknowledge Tim Joyce, who uh, has been working hard to integrate some of this with uh, Century's topside. Hui's ACOMS group provided a uh, has provided support throughout, both on for the hardware, the microbodems, as well as Ross ACOMS. And finally, I want to acknowledge Danny Yerger, Lewis Whitcomb, and Chris German, all of whom have been uh, uh, really valuable, important advisors to me over a long time now, and whose whose ideas are very much present in uh, in what we're we're pursuing now. All right, so um, let me conclude by trying to summarize uh, what I've what I've hopefully shown. Um, what is core exploration? Again, let's go back to that. So in abstract terms, it's a methodology or an approach to deep sea exploration. And I think it's also an approach to facilitate autonomy development. More work to be done there for sure, but I think there's good potential. Um, in practical terms, COEX uses any acoustic bandwidth not required for operational data to transmit scientifically actionable data. So it's always transmitting something, whether you've told it to or not. And the baseline vehicle data that every operator wants is, is always prioritized. In very concrete terms, it's a set of tools for subsea processing, in particular progressive encoding of um, typical AV survey data products, multi-beam, camera, and time series. It's also a set of GUIs that run topside, standalone, to visualize that received data and enable operators to request refinement um, of the data. It's an interface, a nascent one, for managing the acoustic link and reprioritizing data flows. And it's available now, as I said, the, data, the, the work's been open sourced, so I hope it's, uh, you know, we're happy to support um, integration on other vehicles, but in any case, you can give it a try. Uh, under the hood, Ross ACOMS is a critical component of this, and I don't want to understate that. So again, this is produced by the HUI Commun Acoustic Communications Group, provides a transparent, flexible, and efficient Ross message passing specifically for tuned to low throughput communications. Thanks. 
With that, I'll be very happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Mike. This has been awesome. And uh, we'll move into questions. <laughs>